All right, I'm recording. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah. So I guess welcome to the Harder Crawl week of 1120. Um, got a couple things on the agenda today, some quick updates, and then we can just kind of open it up for questions and maybe talk about metrics if we want to. Um, first thing, I know last week we talked about um, having the ability to use multiple GitHub API keys within uh, the GitHub API worker that increases the rate limit and gave, I think you, you finished up this week, right? Uh, yeah, it's been fully implemented and tested and we already have some instances utilizing that and making use of being able to switch between multiple API keys and that's, I mean, able to speed up our data collection for the GitHub API data source, like by a factor of three, four. The biggest, five. the biggest thing on it is really it's for initial data collection. So you can connect your pull, you can collect your pull requests with somebody's IP or somebody's token, your issue repo info, your contributors and your issues and other metadata that we gather with multiple. Because there's really that's that's the initial boot up that we really need it for. Mm -hmm. Right, like you can get your initial data loaded a lot faster if multiple people are contributing their API keys. Yeah, just because there's a, a lot more requests that need to be made. Whereas once you already have data collected, you can just go from the most recent, like new issues or pull requests and page backwards until you discover the ones that you've already inserted um, mm -hmm. in that initial data collection. Mm -hmm. Um, exactly. So how do you use the multiple API keys? Do you, do you specify it in the config in multiple places? Yeah, so, well, so you have your one API key in the config, like normal, mm -hmm. just how everyone's config is set up, and that will be the first API key used. Um, and when that one hits its rate limit for the hour or however long it takes to reset, it will look in the database uh, in the auger operations schema mm -hmm. um, in the worker OAuth table. Mm -hmm. um, and on our development database, I've inserted some of the other developers' API keys uh, for use for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so if someone's using this on their own instance, uh, they would need to go in and insert the API keys that they may have access to. Mm -hmm. That's not something that we would provide for users, mm -hmm. you know, but if they have access to multiple API keys, uh, we want to give them the ability to mm -hmm. speed up their initial data collection. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose it probably would be worth making a little utility command that would let you add additional API keys if you didn't want to actually go into the database. but. Yeah. I, I don't imagine that'll be a super often use case we'll have to worry about. No. Um, and just like with any other API keys, we can't store them in the Git repo or else they'll invalidate them. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is good. We like it. We like that it does that, but yeah. um, it makes that a little bit more complicated. And lots of times we end up uh, managing the data collection for instances that we boot up for people. Um, so in that case, we do. We, we do have access to our team's API keys to speed that up for certain consumers when that is the case, when we're doing the data collection for them. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's kind of where that's at. Um, any questions about that? I think we should all, uh, do you want to hear more about with that? We'll keep well, good. Okay. All right. Um, so one of the other things that I've been working on this week is uh, so we've been collecting data from the Linux, uh, the CI badging API, um, which we really like. Uh, but the way we had it implemented before, we would just we had an exact map of every API, um, like every uh, I don't know to call it field in the API to a column in the database, um, which meant that every time the API definition changed on their end, like if they added new columns or took them away. Um, it would break on our end. So we were very locked in and that was starting to cause some issues every time because they update it frequently, which is good. We like having more data, but um, we didn't want to have to keep, you know, editing the schema. Um, 
And so what I did was I switched over to, uh, instead of having like, it was what, like 200 columns, um, one for each field, it's just, it stores that whole response as a JSON object um, and just a single column in the database. So now it doesn't matter that when the, the Linux Foundation changes or when they change their API schema, we can just pull that JSON object and we can pull exactly what we need from it. Um, and so it's still used the same, like you still use the metric the same, it provides the same amount of data, uh, but the way it stores and retrieves that data is a little bit different. And um, now we won't have to worry about it breaking super often, um, which we are very happy about. Uh, there is a couple, th like one more thing I have to fix with it, just getting, um, making sure that we know um, what project IDs and what like the CII project IDs and our repo IDs go together um, so we can perform the query correctly. Um, instead of just retrieving data for every single project that CII does, we'll be able to specify it. Um, that's not a super hard fix. I just haven't had time. I had to go to Denver the past two days, um, so I haven't had time to figure it out, but that won't take me very long. Um, and that should hopefully allow us to start providing more data more frequently with that. I know it's a pretty, uh, pretty popular thing. Um, any questions about that? No, it all makes sense. Okay, sounds good. Um, and now the other thing that um, we did this week, I know we were talking about working on that configurable front end server. Um, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, so it has become a use case that's come up um, where, where people are running Augur is different from where their endpoints are being hosted. Um, like so, front end. right, yeah. So, let's say they are running Augur, or did I explain that? If they're running Augur in one location, but they are wanting to hit endpoints in another location. Right. Right. So you could run the, in theory, you could run the back end in one server and the front end on another. And there are some environments, mostly EC2, where they have these internal network routed IP addresses where Augur is not able to find its external IP when it's running, but we need to compile it to the external IP so that the front end can find it. And so we've made it change in the auger config.json that would allow you to specify your local IP so augers workers can find auger mm -hmm. and also a separate front end that refers to an external IP so that when you hit the web page it's referring to a server that it can get to from your browser mm -hmm. um, it's um, a heck, and we've only encountered this as a problem on EC2 and other large scale virtual <coughs> machines that are hosted. So where they have an internal IP address inside the data center and an external IP address outside the data center. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very weird, I've never encountered this issue in any other context. Mm -hmm. um, so. What is the problem? So you, Augur, you have to tell Augur what is the external IP address that people use to address it so that it can serve um, the API to the front end. And then the front end will refer to that IP address when it's making the API call. It's just- So it's it not just locked into localhost 5000 anymore? Right, but if you show, okay. but Augur won't start if on these servers only if it's referring not if it's referring to its external IP address instead of the IP address inside the data center. So if you've ever looked at an EC2 instance or Atmosphere, which is the, the research computing cloud that I use for some of my classes, there's they all they all identify inside the network with an IP address that's like a 172 block, but you access them from outside that data center using a 192 block. And these servers will not look at their external, they will not see their external IP address from on the server. Right. It's a, it's very specific to these highly large scale virtualized environments. Mm -hmm. but, but we've got a few people trying it on EC2. And so mm -hmm. that's why we just made this nominal configuration addition. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And we plan on documenting this new optional front end block to specify mm -hmm. a different external host import 
But for the most common use case where uh, the IPs would be in the same location, um, it's backwards compatible to for how everyone's config is already set up. So you don't need to be adding anything new mm -hmm. um, with this change. It's just an extra option to have if that is your situation. Mm -hmm. So this change has already been made in the in the files. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Okay, just making sure. Push up to the. Yep. Um, but yeah, that was good. We were, that was giving me a headache. I had no idea what was happening. I'm glad you had figured it out. Um, and then one other um, kind of internal usage thing, not really internal usage, but just uh, we were running into a, a, a weird error where Dunicorn, or where we thought what was happening was that pip was not respecting our requirements.txt file. Um, and I figured out why. It, I won't dive into the whole thing here. It's, it was very weird. But we have switched from using a requirements.txt file to using um, to specifying requirements in the setup.py file. Um, it's backwards compatible. Um, and if you still want to, you can install using the requirements file, but it just calls the dependent. It just refers to the dependencies that are in setup.py. Um, and now, basically, the reason we saw this problem was because um, Goonicorn version 20 uh, broke Augur, but version 19.9 .9 didn't. Um, and so we were we were trying to specify 19.9, .9 and it, we thought it was like getting ignored. It was installing version 20, and Augur wouldn't compile. Um, so we, by trying to figure out why that was happening, I figured out what the issue was. Um, and so now it's just a small switch to where they're defined. Um, you still use Augur exactly the same. It still gets installed exactly the same. But um, now we won't run into this issue of version packaging versions not being respected. Um, it was pretty small, but it was. It, it took a while to wrap my head around. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> um, but it's yeah. That's um, no. Thank you for mentioning that, Matt. Yeah, that's in depth. Um, and then. Um, Besides that, Sean, I know you've been working on some deployment documentation stuff. Yeah. And then I saw some stuff with time zones yesterday or a couple yeah, days ago. Yeah, we're updating the time zone logic inside of the side. Mm -hmm. um, also making some changes to the way Gabe's made some changes that you probably mentioned last week to the way that we resolve contributors across domains or across facade mm -hmm. so that the facade contributors end up decoded and then the contributors table. Mm -hmm. And that's actually it's working quite well mm -hmm. now. Where essentially, if you have any, like historically with facade or any other Git log processor, you didn't have access to all of the rich information about most of the people who also contribute to GitHub. And we're using some APIs and some other foo to identify, decode, and provide additional information about all the contributors, as well as enhancing uh, facade's original functionality that did mapping of multiple email addresses for a single user onto one user. So instead of seeing five entries for me on the Augur project, you'll see just one entry with one of my email addresses. And uh, this is this is working quite well. And in the case of Facade, you had to actually enter those maps by hand. We're actually generating those maps for people now. How? How? Yeah. We are get it, taking the email and querying a set of services that decode that email into a GitHub ID. And then that GitHub ID, if we have the GitHub ID, we can get all the information that GitHub shares about that person. Okay. So if you've ever committed to GitHub with an email other than the one that you think you're using, and mm -hmm. Matt, believe it or not, you have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you've, you've committed to some, a couple, I have two, where we have these little bizarre local to our Mac emails that don't exist. Huh. Uh, and every time, so you got a couple commits with that fake email, and so those get decoded to germanprey at gmail.com, same as mine when they do that. Okay. Hmm. Does it just pick the um, pick one of the emails to kind of collapse it into, or does it find, have some kind of matching that it uses? No, it picks one. I mean, you can change the one it picked later if you want, but it's a first come, first serve algorithm. Um, in most cases, the first that's going to come is an actual email address that you would recognize. Mm -hmm. But it, to that, which one gets picked is what we call the canonical email 
is subject somewhat to chance with the automated process. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's which one of her hits first. Mm -hmm. Um, but in, in like every case I've looked at and I've, uh, we've got like 8,000 such mapped aliases for one of the repository sets that we're looking at. Red Hat? Uh, one of the repository sets we're looking at um, it is, it's pretty, I, I haven't seen a canonical email that's one of those long strings yet. And fairly often the canonical email ends up being the email tied to the GitHub account if they have one, um, because lots of times the GitHub worker will be the one to discover the contributor initially, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. Facade will go back and discover the aliases. Yeah, and so this, and I've been doing some thinking about this lately as well, like for this uh, identity decoder, in some respects, it would make, it makes sense to run the GitHub worker first. Mm -hmm. get all the emails that we have mm -hmm. and then run the facade worker and then run the contributors model. So issues model, pull request model, facade, then contributors model. Like mm -hmm. if we, if we do the initial population in that sequence, we'll get essentially the canonical email will be the pre preferred email of a GitHub user. Mm -hmm. Obviously we can do the same thing for other services that expose that functionality. I know we've been trying to get that mapping happening for a very long time. I'm, I'm glad it's finally here. Yeah. It's well, been very yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been, you guys are figuring that out. It's I been work. Know. It's been working, but it hasn't been working exactly the way we wanted it to work. So, uh -huh. um, uh, and then what was the stuff with the time zone stuff was just time zone is just, we've been gathering time zones for commits, um, for a long time, mm -hmm. but what I've done is converted them into from a string mm -hmm. into the times. Uh, uh, Postgres has a timestamp TZ mm -hmm. data type, which actually embeds the time zone, mm -hmm. uh, and it's more easily queryable to get the local time zones mm -hmm. than than you storing it as a string. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, do any of this? Does any of this work map to the current or new set of metrics that are coming out? Yeah, it definitely does. Um, especially I ask like if there's any effort that you want to put into getting some of the say images or some of the links to the APIs. That's that's part of what we've been doing in parallel with the work okay. Carter has done in the evolution group. Okay. And we have a, a map of uh, like nine or 10 metrics that map to this in evolution alone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I, there's also a couple metrics in risk. There's a, there are some things that values working on. I just, I want to see what they shake out and I might propose some different ones depending okay. on it. Like there's a, there's one that's been, they've been working on that they're calling social, social currency. currency. Yeah. And I'm not, I, you know, I, you know, I've done a lot of network analysis and things trying to measure influence. Sure, just not sure how that one's going to play out quite yet. Yeah, and, and it really, I think it's much more contextual than the way the value group's approaching it right now. And so we're, we probably won't implement exactly that metric. We, we probably are going to propose something that's more, more parameterized by the project so you can put your project. Key things will be, for example, how much the project relies on issues versus okay. pull requests and, and how do we measure that kind of influence. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, um, that's evolved. That's a, I would call it evolving. That's fair. I don't want to put a metric out just because it's been defined if I'm not confident. If I'm not confident in the science behind it. That's a pretty yeah, complex yeah. metric. Yep. Well, I think that's kind of the point, right? Like it can be, the metric can be brought forward and then it can be thought about in the tooling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, and then I know there were some other, 
at the last evolution meeting, we defined um, one of the metrics that we have implemented. I think it was close issue resolution duration mm -hmm. was the one that we, um, or it was just like issue resolution, issue resolution duration. I forget the exact name, um, but we, Sean Gag and I sat down and worked through the whole definition of that. Um, and I think we've got a couple more of those um, that we have in our API um, that don't have, I think, a direct, like, um, like they have like a definition page in evolution, but they haven't been like formally yeah. like laid out. So um, yeah, the, like the ones we're fleshing out in evolution right now are, are, many of them are ones that we have done mm -hmm. that don't have a chaos metric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, we're adding those as making them chaos metrics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that'll be tomorrow, right? Yeah, that means tomorrow, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that's most of. We also made a, a Matt Snell made a fairly significant change in that I think he's almost finished with to combine the unknown oh. licenses into one bucket. Yes, I was going to showcase that at the end here. Uh, and we also have, have you gotten a list of files ready already? Yeah. So yeah, Matt and I worked out the sequel for those two things and he's been making it part of Augur. And so this is, I think this is going to be a very cool demo. Worth the full screen that Zoom demands. <laughs> <laughs> I concur. Um, so this one's just, it's pretty simple. I did my screen because I, uh, I have to pull up a, another page. But um, basically each of these licenses, you know they link to the SPDX already. Uh, the SPDX recommended pages for the license. <laughs> but all these um, map to no assertion, the ones that were kind of lingering before, don't so have like a half that. a dozen separate weird licenses that didn't map to SPDX, and we just yeah. we threw them all under no assertion. Yeah, and something. Um, so the way I have it put right now, uh, if you click on account, it will generate a JSON document with the names of all the files, and then. Um, deliver it to you. I don't know if there's a better way to do that, but that's, I think, more permanent than a lot of other methods. Um, but basically, it just lists off to all the files that have the license present in the file. I don't um, know what you think, Matt, but I think people who actually want to consume that list are going to be probably clicking no assertion more often than anything else. Yeah, so no assertion. Something I noticed is that a lot. Uh, some of them are images, and some of them are RSTs, things like that. Things that you wouldn't have a license in, but it's interesting that they make it there. So I'll be looking into that too. So um, wait, when you can you close your JSON tabs? Yeah. Like what happens when you click thirty-one? No assertion. Uh, it generates the JSON document and delivers it through a download. Uh, oh, can I see that download? Yeah. And it's the full path from the root of your repository down but to that. Why does it say GPL files? Uh, oh, um, that's something that I made a mistake with. I have to fix that. Okay. <laughs> I, so it, it says, um, it should say the name of the license that's referenced in the, uh, mm -hmm. in what you click. So I, I, I thank you for noticing that. Okay. Um, and um, this isn't this isn't even even deployed yet. This is just uh, my my own branch at this moment. And um, so all of these are like they could have different like licenses that don't map to SPDX, right? Like the ones under no assertion. That's yeah. exactly what anything without a, a license that maps to SPDX is a no assertion. Okay. Um, would it be helpful for people who want to consume this list to also know? like what that license is because they could differ or is it mostly yeah. just about the fact that there's not a defined SPDX license? I didn't have any kind of consensus on what, what kind of, um, what kind of page it should link to or what kind of description it should have. When we talked to Kate and I can't remember if it was in the risk meeting, I think it was either in the risk meeting or a more re a recent conversation that we had with her about the special okay. reports we're doing for Zephyr and Jenkins X her request was simply that anything without uh, SPDX license goes into no assertion. She's, or she's a dual license. Yeah. Okay. So she's, she's not gonna, I don't think she cares what it is. She cares that it's not in that list. Okay. She wants to look into those files. Okay. That makes sense. I just was curious. <laughs> also the, uh, the name of the file will map out correctly for all the other ones. Just not no assertion yet. I'll, I'll just hard code that in. That was, so when you when you click uh, MIT, the file actually comes up as MIT. 
Yeah, so basically the first one that it looked for and no assertion here, the first one it found was it was a general GPL that didn't have any description. So that's why it went said GPL. But the MIT file one is going to just say yeah. MIT. Perfect. Yeah. And I have downloaded so many of these. I feel like there's a be there must be a better way to put it in a folder or something, but I haven't figured it out yet. Oh. Uh, I, my sense from talking to Kate is that, and she's of course only one person, but that the use case is, I want to look at the no assertions and maybe if there's a license I don't want, I want to know about those. Yeah. I, MIT is what they want. And so she, I, I don't see that there'd be any reason for her to download the giant MIT one. It's the exceptions to what she's expecting that she right. wants to look at. Yeah. And I think a JSON file is just fine. I don't think, I think it's more helpful than displaying it on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Especially when if, I was thinking of putting it in a box. Agree? No, I, I do agree. And in fact, I mean, a lot of these things, they get so big, you know, there's so much. Yeah. One yeah. of them is 6,800 in Zephyr. Yeah. Uh, well, if somebody wants to, to really kind of slog their way through that 6,800 with a, uh, a script that that that's fine. JSON's a great way to deliver it. Yeah. Take it, knock yourself out if you want to investigate further. But I think this is a nice like end of the line. Yeah. I don't um, think they want to be looking at that stuff in Augur. No, exactly. They would figure out something. You don't want to encourage it. it. <laughs> and I do have a description there that says um that says if you want to download a it says exactly click on a license count to download a list of associated files. I think that's enough description. Yep, that's fine. Sum it up, yeah. So I I just fixed the no assertion and pushed it to the pull request. Okay. So that should be ready. Right. Yep, I think it looks good. good and the the SPDX document that's at the there that the button at the bottom. Now I have to exit full screen. Yes. Uh, and that just downloads all of them, right? Uh actually it has Sorry. different oh. data. Oh no, that's right. Hang on. I I know what that is. I kind yeah. of brain lapsed. Sorry. The only way it keeps files in the actual SPDX document is by Shaw's. Right. Um, so yeah, that's it gives different kind of information. Pardon my ignorance. No um, I think that's most of what we wanted to get through on our end. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody have any questions? Anything they want us to to hear more about, or want to just talk about, or get our our thoughts on, or anything? No, I mean this is good for me. Oh, um, or I had one more thing I wanted to yeah. ask about that OSI approved licenses section. Should I also include the list of files that have no OSI approved licenses or should I just leave it like it is? I think percentage of OSI license coverage is good enough for now. Yeah. What do you think, Matt, German Prey? In terms of, say that like again. Features in Augur. Like right now we're just showing oh. percentage of like OSI license coverage. I think yeah. that's enough. Yeah, so I think that's fine too. Um, let me, I'm gonna, are you pulling, Matt, did you have that on your screen? Could you pull that up again? I mean, chances are that all of the SPDX license are OSI approved. I mean, the only, the only thing you might wanna do is on that three right there, is you could link link to, the, to a JSON as to which ones are not OSI approved. Oh well, yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. three files yeah yeah if you wanted to add the yeah i mean i think that would be a nice to have too mm -hmm. i don't it's think just like it's just like the other list, list. Yeah. yeah if it's easy to do matt throw her in you're you're muted matt snell by the way <laughs> you, <laughs> I keep you're hitting the mute button like twice by accident <laughs> yes I, I was tapping it with the mouse the touchpad and also with the clicker under the touchpad anyway um i um i have um it's just typescript that's all it is so it's it, i'll just have to add a couple things and it'll be in there okay that'd be great yeah that's perfect um other than that uh i can't think of much anything else if you can sean I'm I'm excited about all the things that are happening with Augur right now. And yeah. it's getting I mean, it's getting really robust and feature rich and there's a lot that people can pull from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think one of the things that you might want to just put on your long term roadmap is if you haven't taken a look at the Grimoire Lab cauldron, that you can actually just go to a web page and just 
point a repository? Mm -hmm. uh, so you, like any repository, you go to a web page and it gives you data? Yep. Because right now, like you either have to set it up locally, Augur. And this isn't like to be solved today, obviously. Or Sean, like I know that you work with other folks and kind of do hosted instances. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a public facing kind of big instance that has everything in it. That's what you mean. Well, but just like, um, hey, I'm curious as to, I'd, like, I'd love to see the like Augur metrics on the chaos community. And I would just okay. cut and paste, copy and paste, GitHub slash chaos, push button. There we go. Yeah. That'd be, nope. That would be really cool. Does That's it do it in real time? Um, well, you should check out Cauldron. Okay. Yeah. Cauldron. Yeah. They, so they revitalized it. I remember it had been like kind of yeah. spider think, webby for a while. Yeah, I think it's a great, great idea. Because it just, it's kind of like um, having a public instance of Phosology. Right. Like I'm just kind of super interested, like really broadly, whether my package has, what licenses are in my package. Mm -hmm. You know, so it'd be just be kind of the same thing. Yeah. That sounds really cool. It definitely sounds like a, a big chunk yeah. to chew, but I, yeah. I, but I, I think that would be a really cool feature. That's depending, a depending what they're delivering there, and I'm having a hard time believing that if they're, do, they're if they're doing it in real time, they have to be delivering a very sparse amount of info. Well, yeah, and that could be. I mean, like I said, it's it could just be something like to kind of give you some some bearings on what's going on. Yeah. But if you really want to do some deep analytics, you actually have to install the tool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think. That's probably pretty easy for us to pull together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A couple API calls, and that's all you really need. Yeah. That yeah. Right. Or, yeah. Just putting a set up on my yeah. to do board here. Set up a wall. My, my strategy board <laughs> where I put things under a magnetic thing so I don't forget about them. <laughs> so that's it. All right. Here's that's an me. excellent thing to point to. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, all right. Yeah. I think we're. Are we done? Then we're done. All right. Bye, guys. All right. See you. Right. Thank you very much. Bye. Later.